Hello friends and welcome to Monster Monday. Today we're going to be covering one of the most classic creatures in D&D and mythology. I'm speaking of course of the Minotaur. Okay guys, I had a request for covering the Minotaur from Jeremiah Torres on the channel. And um, the Minotaur is one of those classic creatures um, from mythology that was incorporated into the game in the earliest versions. Um, and I wanna touch on that before we dig into the books. So if you are not familiar with the mythology of other cultures, whether it's Greek uh, mythology like where the Minotaur comes from, or um, the mythology of other ancient cultures, I strongly recommend that you begin learning about those things because I think that as somebody who's played D&D for a really long time, I take it for granted sometimes how much knowledge I amassed in my youth by reading mythology. So, and I'm not just talking about Greek mythology, I'm talking about the mythology of cultures from all over the world. And the reason why I encourage that is, actually, there are multiple reasons. The main reason is that it expands your mind. When we learn about other cultures and their, the, the ancient cultures and their beliefs and their myths, um, it expands our perspective on the world. It gives us new understanding. So if you haven't dug into the ancient mythology of the Greeks or Norse mythology or Chinese or other Asian mythology, um, you know, the, the Native American mythology. There's so much rich myth out there. And whether you incorporate that myth into your games or not, it's hugely valuable for you to learn about what other cultures um, believed and it expands your mind. So I'm a big proponent of that. And I, I do credit D&D &D for instilling uh, an interest in me in, in learning about history and culture and language and you know ancient mythology, all of that stuff came from my, my love of D&D. &D. So I encourage you folks to do that. And if you already do, if you've already been a big fan of that kind of stuff, then good for you. Um, the other reason why I think it's cool is because when you look at ancient mythology, you could co-opt it and bring it into your game as it is intended. Um, and that's kind of where we're going to start with the Minotaur, because I believe that D&D kind of took the Greek myth of the Minotaur and incorporated it into the game in the most simplistic of terms. In other words, taking the, the legendary stories surrounding the Minotaur. Um, and the easiest way to incorporate a minotaur, of course, is in some kind of labyrinth as it was written in the myths. Um, so whether that's, you know, the labyrinth created by a king or a, a powerful wizard who's created a labyrinth or just a straight up dungeon crawl, all of those are effectively forms of labyrinths or mazes. And um, putting a minotaur into that situation is pretty easy. But of course, on Monster Monday, I like to dig a little deeper into the lore. I also like to give you variations on how you can use the Minotaur, and I think I'm gonna be able to do that pretty effectively today. So, strap on your thinking caps, people. Um, what I'm gonna do before I read the fifth edition description is dig a little bit deeper back um, into an older version because I do like to compare sometimes. So, uh, in the Minotaur description for third edition, um, we have a large monstrous humanoid, 6d8 plus 12 hit dice. That's fairly strong, with a challenge rating of four. Um, primary attacks are still the huge great axe with uh, the ability to gore. That totally makes sense based on their, their physical build. Um, and in the third edition description, they also had the, um, the combat uh, ability to charge. They had natural cunning, um, which gave them an innate cunning and logical ability, making them immune to maze spells and preventing them from ever becoming lost and enables them to track enemies. 
further, they are never caught flat-footed. So those are some of the third edition mechanics. But basically, the idea is that when a minotaur is in its you know, maze or labyrinth or dungeon environment, it's, its home environment, it has some special abilities so that it's not caught off guard. It can't get lost in its own maze, that kind of stuff. Really, that only comes into play if you have a complex labyrinth, maze, or dungeon with many different passages and many different ways to get around in that dungeon um, so that the Minotaur can take advantage of, of techniques like circling back around, you know, running away from a party, circling back around and attacking them from a different location, or popping out from a secret door to ambush them, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, that's a pretty decent description. Um, let's actually read the, the text. Minotaurs are strong, fiercely territorial creatures often found in vast underground labyrinths. Okay, That's basically what they were in the actual Greek mythology. A minotaur's natural cunning and feral instincts enable it to find its way easily through even the most confusing tunnel complexes, an ability it puts to great use in hunting, tormenting, and ultimately destroying intruders. A minotaur looks very much like a powerfully muscled human with the head of a bull standing well over seven feet tall and covered in shaggy fur. The dark eyes of the beast gleam with savage fury. Minotaurs speak giant. That's interesting. Okay, so pretty simple, basic level thing there in third edition. In the fifth edition uh, monster manual, if you want to follow along at home, this is on page 223. A minotaur's roar is a savage battle cry that most civilized creatures fear. Born into the mortal realm by demonic rites, minotaurs are savage conquerors and carnivores that live for the hunt. Their brown or black fur is stained with the blood of fallen foes, and they carry the stench of death. Most minotaurs are solitary carnivores that roam labyrinthine dungeons, twisting caves, primeval woods, and the maze-like streets and passages of desolate ruins. A minotaur can visualize every route it might take to close the distance to its prey. Hold right there. So right off the bat here in 5th edition, the writers have already expanded the potential uses for the Minotaur. They acknowledge the mythological origins uh, insofar as, you know, they like to roam labyrinthine dungeons, right? That's the, the nod to the myth. But they expand that by talking about twisting caves, primeval woods, maze-like streets and passages of desolate ruins. So. Right there, we've expanded how much we can incorporate the Minotaur. This becomes huge because it gives DMs opportunities to drop in Minotaurs more than just in the very limited scope that was originally intended by the myth. Um, another important word here, a descriptor that we need to consider, is solitary. Um, in the myth, there were not Minotaurs or Minotaurs. I've always said Minotaur, but it's, it's, I think it's actually Minotaur because of Minos. Um, but the, the idea that they're solitary is basically structured after the original myth. And certainly you are welcome to make these a strong adversary who hunts a party. That could be a thing. You could have a very similar situation for a short adventure where your party is captured by a coalition of wealthy nobles who fancy, you know, hunting real people. And they're stripped of all their cool, fancy armor, weapons, magic books, and all that stuff. And they're put out into this open landscape where the group of nobles hunts them on horseback. And maybe they keep a minotaur on the grounds of the, um, the nobles' land to become the hunter. Or maybe the nobles don't actually hunt. Maybe the nobles just put the minotaur into the land. They release the minotaur, and the minotaur does the hunting of the party. And um, through magical means, the nobles can sit comfortably in their living room and watch as the party is hunted by the minotaur. Um, the scent of blood, the tearing of flesh, and the cracking of bones spur a minotaur's lust for carnage, overwhelming all thought and reason. In a blood rage, a minotaur charges anything it sees, butting and goring like a battering ram, then chopping the fallen in twain. Apart from ambushing creatures that wander into its labyrinth, a minotaur cares little for strategy or tactics. That's another important thing to consider, which I will touch on in when we're thinking about how to use variations of these guys. Minotaurs seldom organize. They don't respect authority or hierarchy, and they are notoriously difficult to enslave, let alone control. 
So that would counter my idea about an enslaved minotaur who hunts um, for sport so that nobles can be entertained. But, you know, I like to bend the rules, so we'll think about that. Cults of the Horned King. Minotaurs are the dark descendants of humanoids transformed by the rituals of cults that reject the oppression of authority by returning to nature. Inductees often mistake these cults for druidic circles or totemic religions whose ceremonies involve entering a labyrinth while wearing a ceremonial animal mask. Within these bounded environments, cultists hunt, kill, and eat wild beasts, indulging their basis primal urges. In the end, however, sacrificial animals are exchanged for humanoid sacrifice, sometimes an inductee that tried to escape the cult after learning its secrets. These labyrinths become blood-soaked halls of slaughter, echoing to the cultist's savagery. Unknown to all but their highest ranking leaders, these mystery cults are creations of the demon lord Baphomet, the Horned King, whose lair of the abyss is a gigantic labyrinth. Some of his followers are fervent supplicants that plead for strength or power. Others come to the cult seeking a life free from authority's chains and are liberated of their humanity instead as Bahamut transforms them into the minotaurs that echo his own savage form. Although they begin as creations of the Horned King, minotaurs can breed true with one another, giving rise to an independent race of Baphomet's savage children in the world. Okay, so, so much to compare. So how does the fifth edition version differ from previous editions? Well, for one, um, they're not, you know, giants who were created mythologically in the truest sense by the coupling of um, a divine bull with, um, you know, a female human. Um, these are abyssal creations. And in fact, in fifth edition, what do they speak? Abyssal, not giant, unlike their counterparts in third edition. So um, the inclusion of Baphomet and the transformation of the Minotaur into a more uh, D&D-centered kind of theme to connect it is a big step. And I, I don't disagree with it. I'm fine with that. If you want to use that as a DM, I think it's a great way to step away from the Greek mythological origins and make it more um, D&D-centric, right? Continuing with what D&D has established uh, in their worlds. Um, however, I will point out a couple things that I think make this very open for innovation and for scalability. So when we look at the Minotaur, it is a large monstrosity. Um, armor class 14. It has uh, the charge ability as in previous versions. It has labyrinthine recall, which means it can perfectly recall any path it has traveled. And what's funny about that is that doesn't lock it into a labyrinth. Any path it has traveled. So it could be out in the open wilds, hunting amidst mountains and crags or forests or wherever. Um, that's a huge ability. Reckless, at the start of its turn, the Minotaur can gain advantage on all melee weapon attacks it makes during this turn, but attack rolls against it also have advantage. Um, it attacks with a great axe or it's a gore attack, and it's considered a challenge rating three. So where does that put the Minotaur in terms of how you can use it in your campaigns, your adventures, and for encounters? So as we've mentioned um, in fifth edition, they open up the options significantly for you to be able to include a Minotaur in a lot of different scenarios. Like they've said in the book here, almost anywhere, really other than civilized population um, areas, you know. So you probably wouldn't find a minotaur wandering around a city, um, but you could find it in ruins. You could find it out in the open, in mountains, in crags, valleys. Um, you could find it, I suppose you could find a minotaur in the desert. There's no reason why you couldn't. Um, maybe there's like a series of connected you know, hills and desert and little oases, and the Minotaur kind of stalks that area, knowing that travelers come through there because they need to resupply on water, and that Minotaur is like a threat in the desert. Could you have a Minotaur in an Arctic setting? Absolutely. Um, the Minotaur is, you know, covered in fur. Why couldn't they, you know, be lurking in a specific area of a very frozen, remote um, place where you know, travelers go through on their way from one place to another 
um, and maybe it's a wide swath of you know hundreds of miles where this minotaur and other minotaurs kind of um, stalk and hunt their prey. So I think that opens up a lot of options. Um, even in an island setting, you could have an island that has you know one or more minotaurs. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways that you could drop these guys in. Now when we talk about scalability, here's where I think it could get very interesting. Um, so minotaurs have become a playable race in D&D. Uh, a couple of years ago, actually, they, they did an Unearthed Arcana about centaurs and uh, minotaurs being playable races. As a playable race, a minotaur is a medium-sized creature. Medium-sized, not large, like the monster version. So, you guys, if you've been watching Monster Monday, you know that one of the things that I do when I think about how to scale a monster for low, mid, and high-level adventures is simply changing literally the scale of that monster so they can be smaller, medium, or even bigger than large, or buffing them up with more hit points, a higher armor class, multiple attacks, different options there. So let me share with you some of the scaling techniques that I've thought of for this episode. Um, if you have a low level party, let's say you have six first or second or even third level characters who encounter this Minotaur. The Minotaur's challenge rating is three, but if you really look closely, this thing could probably kill most members of a party in one or two attacks. So putting up a normal Minotaur against a low-level party is very likely going to lead to some, some character deaths. So how can you scale that? Well, one option is you simply make the medium-sized versions of the Minotaur and you drop their hit points a little bit. You drop their bonus um, to their strength um, attack. So you know instead of their great axe doing 2d12 plus 4, Maybe it only does 1d12 plus 4, or maybe it does, you know, 2d6 plus 2. So you can change how much damage they do with their attacks. That, that's one significant way. So if you have a low-level party, you can make the Minotaur medium-sized. You can make it um, have, you know, less damage for its gore and its great act attacks uh, and, and a little bit less hit points. And now you can actually use a Minotaur with a lower level party. All right, at mid-level, these things are kind of scaled appropriately, but I guess it depends also on the strength and numbers and strategic abilities of your party at mid-level. So a really basic party at mid-level would be pretty evenly matched with one Minotaur, as it's written in the book. However, if, for example, you said, well, I've got a group of seventh level people. They are veteran players. They work really well strategically. They have a lot of powerful spells, etc. Then how do you make this Minotaur encounter more effective? Maybe you have several Minotaurs. Maybe you have a large Minotaur as written in the book, and you have uh, three to four medium sized Minotaurs who are part of that Minotaur's pack. And here's where I think it's interesting. Nowhere in this book does it talk about packs. It, it very specifically says that minotaurs are solitary creatures. But you're the DM. You are the god of your own world. So why couldn't you create that? Let's say that you're talking about a higher level adventure. What's to stop you from creating a pack of large minotaurs who are hunting the party? Now you have their abilities to be reckless but you can, as a DM, add in pack tactics if you wanted. Maybe this pack of minotaurs um, has been enhanced intellectually and they, they work together as a pack. Like, and, and the pack tactics approach gives them flanking strategy, gives them advantage on attacks when they're going reckless or when they're flanking. So this, right off the bat, could take the minotaur as written and you know, you, you throw six of them now at a higher level party and this has become a more challenging encounter. Let's go even a step further. What if you have a really high level power, uh, high level um, party? Maybe Baphomet has elite minotaurs and these elite minotaurs are actually using uh, magical weapons, magical armor. 
They have um, pack tactics. They're, they're basically um, able to you know, attack the party and maybe they don't take damage from non-magical weapons as well. Um, or maybe they have um, immunity to fire damage, let's say, or immunities to several kinds of damage, which are blessings from Baphomet. So you could take a high-level party and Baphomet could have this elite group of Minotaurs who are large, who have pack tactics, who have damage immunities and magic resistances and all that kind of stuff, and now they've become serious contenders even against a higher level party. So I like the idea of variation. I like the idea of taking this um, one monster that was drawn from Greek mythology and expanding how you can use it. And I think in any of these cases, whether it's the low, mid, or high level options, throwing a minotaur into your game or multiple minotaurs or medium-sized minotaurs could really make your game a little more rich and vibrant and it could kind of change things up for your party and your group might actually be challenged by these encounters. Um, now those are all scalable things. Those are all ideas for different encounters and pushing the encounters location to different geographical and climatic settings are all things that I've shared. But how do you make Minotaur as part of a larger overall storyline or series of adventures in your campaign? I think for that, you go back to the idea of Baphomet. And you, you say that, you know, the party, let's suppose that the party is a party of good people, and whether they knew it or not, they foiled a plan that Baphomet had going in the mortal realm. And now Baphomet's kind of got them on his radar. Maybe the initial encounters at the lower to mid levels are with the medium sized minotaurs. But you take this idea that they explore here of a cult and you expand that idea into your campaign. And you make this cult of Baphomet. And you, by the way, as a DM, don't reveal that it's a cult of Baphomet like early on. Okay? So you make this, you take this idea of this cult and you make this cult a real faction in your campaign. Not the only faction, but a faction that the party is running up against periodically in adventures. Until it gets to a boiling point in your storyline, a climax where the parties may be at higher mid-levels or lower high levels, and they're starting to really unravel the secrets and they find out that this is a cult of Baphomet. And that's when they start encountering the more powerful, um, intellectual, strategic, elite minotaurs. Um, and maybe you even intertwine some of this human, you know, mortal cultist element in there. So maybe when the party's at higher level, these elite minotaurs are backed up by a evil wizard who serves Baphomet. And, you know, uh, maybe there's some element of, you know, that evil wizard whose backstory ties into earlier encounters that the party had at, when they were like low level or mid level. And now they're thinking that the evil wizard is the one behind these minotaurs and behind these evil deeds that have been done when in fact it's actually that wizard is just yet another pawn up the scale, but still a servant of Baphomet. So there are a lot of ways that you can integrate these into adventures and even whole campaign threads by, by making this a faction in your campaign. But um, I really think the Minotaur is great. Uh, it's very flexible. You can scale it in so many different ways. And hopefully you guys got something out of this. Um, thanks again to Jeremiah Torres for the suggestion. And if you guys have any cool stories that you'd like to share about how your group used Minotaurs, or if you're a DM who has used Minotaurs creatively, feel free to post those in the comments below. Uh, we like to share ideas here in our community. And as always, thanks for watching Monster Monday. Please consider subscribing, liking this video, and clicking on that notifications bell so that you know when the next episode's coming out. Happy adventuring.